This is Epicenter, episode 326 with guest Kevin Wang. Today our guest is Kevin Wang, and Kevin's the co-founder of the Nervos Network. So Nervos is a project that came out of China in 2018 and launched its main net a few months ago. What's interesting about Nervos is that it has such a unique architecture if you compare it to any other smart contract platform that is coming out today, right? So whether it's Polkadot or Cosmos or ETH 2.0, all these platforms, they implement at least one of two things, some form of proof of stake and some form of sharding to achieve scalability. Now, Nervos has a very different approach. When you first look at it, you notice that it has a two-layered architecture. There's a base layer for transactions and computations happen on a layer two off-chain. So let's focus on the base layer for a moment because this is where things are really interesting. This base layer is called the Common Knowledge Base or CKB and it acts like a generalized verification network. So let's take a Bitcoin transaction for a second. When you create a Bitcoin transaction, your client verifies that the inputs correspond to unspent outputs in the UTXO set before broadcasting it through the network. So your client does computations locally, and then those computations are verified by the network and added to blocks. Well, Nervos have a similar approach, but they've generalized UTXO in a way that it can also hold smart contract state. So actual computations are done off-chain on a layer two, and the CKB does the verification. So this is in stark contrast to Ethereum, where computations are done on-chain, and users only have the assurance that computations are verified once they've received the valid block. So another similarity to Bitcoin is that Nervous leverages proof of work. So their team stands firmly behind Nakamoto consensus, and they've created an optimized version of proof of work called NCMAX that greatly improves throughput and Kevin describes these improvements during the interview. So according to Kevin, one of the advantages to the CKB approach is that apps retain their composability. So I think that there's still quite a few unanswered questions about ETH 2.0 and how apps living on different shards will maintain composability. And so the, the issue here is that apps that depend on each other might end up living on the same shards, which kind of defeats the purpose of sharding in the first place. Well, in Nervous, there's no sharding. There's just a global unified state and preservation of all assets on the CKB layer. I should point out that the Nervous Grants program is a sponsor of Epicenter, but not of this particular episode. Sunny and I had been planning to do an interview with Nervous after they launched, and it just happens to coincide with the grants program sponsorship of the podcast, which began last week. A bit of housekeeping. France Blockchain Week is happening here in Paris, on my home base, on the week of March 2nd. This will be the third year of ETCC. It is on March 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And over the weekend, we've got the ETH Paris Hackathon on the 6th, 7th, and 8th. So ETCC is taking entirely new dimensions this year. They have a new event venue, which is much bigger and much nicer than the previous year's. Uh, I don't even know how many speakers there are. There are just so many. Um, There's several speaker tracks, but go to ecc.io to get all the details. ECC is organized by Ethereum France. They're a nonprofit organization, so the tickets are actually quite affordable. So it's a great opportunity to come to a great conference in a great city and not spend a whole lot of money, especially if you're in Europe. I mean, it's just you know, a skip and a hop from just about any European town. So you should definitely come. And if you're going to be here on Wednesday, the 4th, we're going to have an Epicenter drinks meetup. So, you know, if if you're coming to Paris, I'm going to buy you a drink. That's just how it's going to be. So uh, Frederica, Sunny, and I will be having this drinks meetup on the 4th, and it will be our absolute pleasure to hang out with you. So do register at epicenter.rocks slash Paris meetup. Before we go to the interview, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor for today's episode, Pepo, where the crypto community comes together with short video updates and tokens of appreciation. So whether you're a crypto developer, a podcaster, an analyst, a blogger, 
or just an enthusiast, there's never been an easier way to showcase your work, earn appreciation, and connect with the community. So ETH Denver starts in a couple of days, and Pepo is going to be there. In fact, they are the official social app of ETH Denver. So you should download Pepo to follow all the ETH Denver action. And if you're going to ETH Denver, you can use Pepo to complete little missions. They're going to be putting up little challenges on Pepo, and you can win Pepo coins if you complete these missions. And what's great about Pepo coins is you can use them to share your appreciation for, for others, but you can also use them to buy actual things. You can use them in the Pepo store to buy gift cards for Starbucks, Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, and many other merchants. And if you can't be there in person like me, if you're stuck on the other side of the ocean or something, well, you can use Pepo to watch updates from your favorite projects. You can ask questions and you can share your thoughts. So to download Pepo, go to pepo.com slash epicenter. That lets them know that we sent you. And you can follow me there. I'm at Seb 2.0. That's S-E-B 2 P-O-I-N-T 0. We'd like to thank Pepo for their support of the podcast. And with that, here's our conversation with Kevin Wang. We're here with Kevin Wang. Kevin is the co-founder of Nervos. Nervos is a multi-asset store of value blockchain, which comes out of China. And Kevin is going to walk us through how Nervos works. And specifically, uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting about Nervos is that unlike many of the other blockchains that are now coming into the ecosystem, Nervos uses proof of work, which will, I'm sure, ruffle the feathers of many of our listeners. But nonetheless, it's a really interesting model. Thanks for joining us today, Kevin. Good to be here. Thank you, Sebastian and Sunny, for inviting me. So let's start with a bit of your background, which is far removed from what you're doing now. Previously, you you were a consultant, you worked for IBM, and and then you started one of the biggest tech podcasts in China. What is it like running a podcast in China? I've heard a lot of things. I've heard that running a podcast in China is very different from running a podcast here. One of the reasons why, because people in China that run podcasts actually make money. <laughs> but uh, yeah, tell us a bit about your background. So <laughs> we didn't really run a for-profit one, but uh, so specifically the podcast. So it was a technology-focused one called T Hour, and actually this is how I met some of the co-founders of the uh, of Nervos. So it was quite interesting. It was at the time the largest. Um, okay, maybe we shouldn't collect the largest, but one of the largest definitely technology podcasts, sort of focused on programmers and um, sort of hackers, entrepreneurs, that type of audience. And then it was quite fun. We ran some somewhere like over 100 episodes, I believe, and you got a lot of folks. But yeah, so uh, for me, myself specifically, I was a trained as a software engineer. And like you said, I worked for IBM, uh, started my career there, uh, Silicon Valley Lab, and um, did some big data uh, engineering solutions <laughs> before they were called big data. Anyway, so and then uh, sort of jumped into the startup world and you know got into open source and you know the web. But this is like between two thousand and two thousand ten, where you know you see a lot of um, you know social apps and and whatnot. A lot of entrepreneurs moving to that space. So I caught you know part of that wave, and I work with a good friend of mine, and we started a developer education business or startup that would focus on training people to become software engineers, professional software engineers. Yeah. Then, you know, through the journey, uh, you know, I discovered Bitcoin like many other folks. And it had, you know, reading the Bitcoin white paper had a really profound, was a really profound experience for me. And so I knew that I always wanted to do something in this space. And uh, started Nervos with uh, some of the other co-founders back in the beginning of 2018, and then has been working on this since. So when I came in, uh, you know, visited you guys actually in your office uh, last year, and it, I came visit you guys in uh, Hangzhou, which it, and you know it was a really cool experience. It's just sort of like the startup capital of China. So can you tell us a little bit about what like the scene is like in Hangzhou and? You know, what kind of other startups are there? Are there other a lot of other blockchain companies based out of there? So Hangzhou is known as the fintech center of, of China. And, uh, you know, the, the biggest player, obviously, is Alipay, uh, which is part of the Alibaba group. And, um, and they have also many, many products. 
have a, run a huge operation there. And then you have uh, sort of more traditional fintech companies. You have uh, like these P2P fintech companies. Um, and in the blockchain space, there are also many companies. And um, so Zhejiang University is there, which is one of the largest engineering focused universities in China. And um, so a lot of good engineers come out of university and then there is, uh, you know, we are there and I would say our engineers are mostly in Hangzhou and you also have I'm um, Token, which is wallet um, company and you have Spark Pool, which is the largest Ethereum mining pool there. And then you also have some permission blockchain companies there as well. And also a lot of researchers, a lot of researchers and blockchain engineers. Uh, because we we have events regularly in Hangzhou, and then so we kind of we kind of know that crowd pretty well. It's also a very entrepreneurial city. So, what would you say is the level of interaction between the fintech community there, and I guess more specifically the blockchain community, and with sort of the West and Europe and, and the US? Like, are you seeing a lot of interaction, or is it mostly just sort of encapsulated there? Yeah, it's interesting because it's very sort of the wind shifts a lot, right? And it's very much regulation driven. And in the early days, when there wasn't clear regulation or like where the line would be drawn, then there is a lot of people try to, you know, sort of cross the boundary and do a little bit of blockchain, but also like traditional fintech or, uh, or fintech company looking to blockchain and things like that. But so the regulation in China, uh, I mean, that in itself, it's a pretty big topic. So now I think it's more, you know, clear uh, where the boundary is. So the traditional companies tend to be more, you know, permission to blockchain, uh, using bl- permission to blockchain space. And, you know, the public blockchain, which is, you know, crypto assets and smart contract platforms tend to more like, you know, grassroots. And then we see some, you know, trend. It's only uh, since last year, President Xi Jinping sort of had this top-down mandate, you know, for the country to develop blockchain technology. So there is some trend coming along that it, this can converge. But then that process, I think, is starting. But you know, we're not really there yet. Okay, interesting. I think it, it would be really helpful for us at some point to do a whole episode on the Chinese ecosystem. And all of the, you know, the regulation, but also all the initiatives that are coming out of there. From this side of the world, it's often um, hard to to dissect. Yeah, it's very different. <laughs> I've been actually following a lot of Jan's work for uh, your other co-founder for a while uh, because uh, his company, uh, Cryptape, they were actually they actually built one of the first alternative implementations of Tendermint, and so they had a version of Tendermint in Rust about like two years ago. So I've been following them since then. So what's the relationship between the Cryptape company and Nervos? Is it sort of like one of the main development companies or is it Cryptape has just sort of turned fully into Nervos at this point? Good question. And um, it's the first uh, first one that you mentioned is Cryptape is the main developing companies for Nervos. And uh, so in a way, it's very similar to Tendermint and Cosmos, right? So the Nervos is a public blockchain project governed by its own foundation. And uh, Cryptape is tasked with engineering tasks, like implementing the protocol and you know, develop the ecosystem, tool chain products and, and things like that. And so Cryptape, you know, originally started off with doing some more private blockchain development. And then what drove the vision to decide, you know what, we're going to instead start focusing on building a, a public blockchain. So what was that vision there for Nervos? Yeah, so it really from, like you mentioned, Jian Xie, right? So he was a uh, core Ethereum researcher, core developer, uh, that he used to work with Vitalik pretty closely uh, in the early days, I think 2016, uh, around 2016. And uh, at the time, like you said, Cryptic built a permission blockchain called Sita. So it's a variation of, uh, like you said, BFT, Tendermint, uh, but you know he was at the time he was still working with Ethereum team pretty closely, and you know through the almost two years he worked there, he really got a front row view of um, you know how Ethereum has grown and also how Ethereum has uh, many of the you know growing pains 
right? And this is, I think, that experience informed him of a vision that, you know, maybe we could do a, a different direction. If we start with Bitcoin, right, and then you get to Ethereum, which has smart contract capabilities and you know general computation uh, capabilities, and then Nervo's CKB or Common Knowledge Base, the layer one blockchain, is almost sort of if you go from Bitcoin to get to a, a you know turn complete smart contract platform, you either go to the direction of uh, Ethereum or you go to the direction of uh, CKB, right? So like turning left, you go to CKB; turning right, you go to Ethereum. Uh, I think both ways are, are are viable, but you know he 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 felt there's the advantages to that going uh, the the technical architecture that we chose. But obviously, we can get into more of that in this podcast. I mean, it's kind of interesting that you guys came from you know heavily from the Ethereum community when you know just by looking at some of the architectural decisions. If I had to guess, and I didn't know, I would have thought you guys were like Bitcoiners, like starting to build a smart contracting platform with like proof of work and UTXOs and. So it's a very, you're right. It's a very interesting design paradigm that's pretty different than Ethereum and what a lot of the existing uh, smart contracting systems are moving towards. Yeah, just about anybody else. <laughs> so let's talk about the Nervos vision then. Can you describe at a high level what you're trying to build here and why you're building it this way? So Nervos Network is it's a layered architecture. So in the early days, we specifically chose the direction of sort of scaling through layer two, right? So in other words, we keep layer one as simple and play a limited role in the whole ecosystem as possible, and then use layer two uh, as the scaling layer. So that decision informs a lot of the actual technical trade-offs that we made, uh, including you know things like what Sunny mentioned that we use POW, and uh, so the rationale here is, sure, if we ch- if we're to choose, uh, you know, POS and some novel consensus algorithms, we use Nakamoto consensus NC Max, a variation of Nakamoto consensus, and we could potentially achieve higher scalability. But on the other hand, if you have chosen to scale with layer two, then you don't necessarily have to do that, right? We sort of maximize, uh, take a no compromise approach on decentralization. And you know, protecting the full node, the running, the the cost of running full node, and um, you know, just like a Bitcoin BTC, and we don't do sharding, um, and want to make sure to keep all the global state in one piece. Obviously, Turing complete to support layer two. So all this come together, right? Is the the Nervos network, and also, uh, you know, I know we'll get into this a little bit later too. And also on the crypto economic side, uh, we feel like we fixed some of the issues that Bitcoin faces and then also have a crypto economics model that's specifically designed to be the layer one for layer two as well. So both, I would say, architecturally as well as crypto economically, Nervous Network's layer one is designed uh, for layer two solution technologies and together that's a Nervous Network. You, you said that you don't do sharding. So basically the, the layer one conserves all the different states of of uh, of the history of of the nervous network, so explain then why is nervous better for L, for L two than any of the other uh, scaling approaches that we see currently in the ecosystem. You know, it's a pretty big topic, so I I'll just kind of spread a little bit and not to get into depth of each one. And um, uh, I think first you have to look at what layer two is best for, right? So layer two technologies um, are best to uh, for scaling and you have really cheap potentially really fast finality and really fast confirmation and and can scale really well so when you design a layer one for that purpose to complement layer two you want to get things that layer two need and layer two uh layer two solutions don't have which is you want to have some sort of global settlement layer right that is objective and which kind of points to pow you want to have a uh, layer one system that's uh, secure, and we can talk about the crypto economic model of, of Nervos uh, layer one a little bit. You want to pick one that doesn't have sharding, um, so that you have global state together, so you don't have to get into the sort of synchronization of different states and all that issues. You want to pick a layer one uh, system that's um, decentralized, right? Maximum decentralized. Again, 
it's difficult to push for that if you want scaling on layer one as well, right? But if you don't need scaling on layer one, we want to push the other direction. We want to be no compromise decentralization, right? Which means you got to be able to protect sort of like a BTC, right? You want to protect the cost of running full nodes as much as possible. And also, you know, complete Turing scrutability. Like Bitcoin uh, cannot be that layer because the lack of uh, opcodes or Turing complete. So one of the main benefits, you know, as opposed to Ethereum then uh, here would be the lack of sharding. Why is that that important for L2? Like, you know, let's say, you know, as long as all the participants of a particular L2 system are on a single shard, then it should be fine, right? Like as long as all the per- players in this plasma game all are on have an account on that shard, why does it affect the fact that there are other shards in in the Ethereum world? That's true, and um, we what we have seen, for example, in the in the DeFi space, specific use case, right? And you have a lot of applications that kind of depend on each other and then or we talk we call this compos- composability when you have applications depend on each other you want to make sure that they can synchronize state very easily right what you will see probably in a sharded uh, blockchain you see that interdependent applications tend to then reside on the same shard right? because that would make the most sense however this kind of defeats the purpose of sharding if let's say you know defi or some other killer application uh, would evolve and then you have to put all of them the same shard, then you go back to the issue of scalability because how do you scale the shard? So, you know, what we see is, um, you know, first of all, layer one, we want to have a global and unified global state. And there's a lot of value from that. And um, like I said, right, so you can compose very easily. You know, the way we think about this is layer one is for preservation of assets, right? So uh, that's the most valuable, like when we talk public blockchains, the value of public blockchains derives not from the fact that they can do computations or they can do pass messages around, right? But they, they can support applications focused on value or, or assets or finance, right? Then whenever you have assets, then sort of DeFi applications and tend to go with the assets. So you will see that, you know, DeFi very naturally uh, would prefer a blockchain that has this unified global state. Then all the composability can happen and it's just much easier for that purposes. So you mean that there will need to develop an ecosystem of composability even for L2? So let's say I need to be able to close my payment channel that triggers some event happening on a plasma chain it's good to have those on on shared state so that way they can kind of affect each other easily yeah you could but again um that's not the advantage of layer two right so unless your layer one is absolutely crowded and then you just it's too expensive to perform these uh, uh, you know transactions Sure, you know, I'm not saying they cannot be performed on layer two, but these type of applications I call, you know, settlement type of transactions, uh, these are high value transactions, and then these typically need global consensus. So, I mean, the best place to perform them is on layer one, and you have, you know, a, a mechanism that's clearly that can, um, you know, reach global consensus because that's the most valuable, uh, those are the most valuable transactions in a way. So let's talk about the uh, the consensus mechanism. So I mentioned at the beginning of the show that Nervos uses proof of work, and it has a variance of Nakamoto consensus, which is called NC Max or Nakamoto consensus Max. Can you explain what is NC Max and how does it improve on the Bitcoin proof of work that we're used to? Yeah, so NC here stands for Nakamoto consensus, which really is Bitcoin's consensus mechanism, right? This chain-based consensus mechanism, you know, prefers availability. And this is, again, the uh, another sort of layer one, what we believe is um, probably the layer one should should have. So NC Max improves on uh, Nakamoto consensus in, in several ways, right? So first, uh, we believe that Bitcoin's 10 minute per block underutilized bandwidth. And uh, in fact, it's very wasteful. So we want to have a mechanism that can dynamically adjust difficulty um, so that uh, instead of 
you know, to keep like 10 minutes per block, we want to target a specific uncle rate. Um, let's say, uh, I think currently it's targeting up between 3 to 5%. So this way, um, you know, within that range of uncle rates, we can keep the block time as fast as possible. So right now, I think our block time is somewhere sub 10 seconds, I think 7, 8 seconds per block, and still have very reasonable uncle rates uh, to achieve consensus. So I think that's one. The other property that NCMAX uh, prioritized for is to maximize the, the bandwidth. So Nakamoto consensus has this, for every transaction, they will be propagated twice through the network. And then for NCMAX, we want to make sure that we only propagate those once. So that, again, to, to best conserve uh, bandwidth. So ultimately, the goal, the design of NCMAX is this. Right. So what we believe again, we want to maximize for decentralization and, and, and you know preserve the the, the, the cost running full nodes. And then, you know, for any given let's say three you know, somewhere like a three to a thousand full nodes and you know around that range, then it really becomes a function for any sort of consensus algorithm, really becomes a function of how you can best utilize bandwidth. And that's what NCMAX is designed for, to best utilize bandwidth. So in Bitcoin, we have a 10-minute block time, and the idea here is that within 10 minutes, we'll have near-perfect propagation of one megabyte size blocks. But you know, given the evolution of you know, sort of bandwidth globally and how that's improving, you know, we can probably assume that that's a very high margin of security. And so rather than Taking this approach, Nervos is taking the approach where instead of trying to limit the uncle rate by having this very, very long block time, you're going to optimize for the uncle rate by analyzing it and uh, in real time and adjusting the difficulty based on the actual conditions in the network. Is that a fair? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got it. So if technology improves and then, you know, in the future network bandwidth, let's say go 10x and it's possible, it's been going up since the last, you know, several decades and with the 5G coming up, there's even more room to improve. Yeah. So again, the, the transaction per second for our layer one protocol, NCMAX will, will increase automatically. And uh, another thing that I forgot to mention, like the third property of the improvement is that um, we uh, for Bitcoin protocol, the reason self -mi selfish mining is, is is profitable is because they don't count the uncles, the uncle blocks, uh, into consideration of a difficulty adjustment, and therefore attackers can sort of increase the uncle rate and then have decreased um, you know difficulty for the next epoch and then or you know difficulty adjustment and then uh, become profitable, right? So self mining can be profitable, and for us, we count the uncles also within consideration of difficulty adjustment, and therefore self-mining is not profitable on uh, Nervo CKD. Okay, so here you eliminate selfish mining by adjusting that difficulty rate on, you know, at, on the fly sort of thing, and then, and then that makes selfish mining unprofitable for anyone who's trying to attempt that. How does the network know what the uncle rate is? How does that get incorporated into say, a block, or you know, how does that information get captured and, and transmitted across the network for that difficulty rate to be adjusted? Okay. I, <laughs> this is where I'm a little bit out of my expertise here, because I'm not the developer that actually wrote the code to implement the, uh, the consensus algorithm. You know, I'll kind of go on the limb and say it's probably a property on the block headers, but again, uh, for folks that really want to, I think it is. Out. I think what from what I read, it's a property on the block headers. But I, I, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what 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 I'm asking here, and you know, it's it's fine if you don't know this, but it's like, how does the network uh, sort of come to consensus on what orphan blocks are? I I don't, I don't know if you can shed some light on, on this, Sunny. I mean, it'll be like similar to how Ethereum already does it, right? Where in Ethereum the miner will include any uncle blocks up to a depth of seven in the header. And they're incentivized to include them because they also get a reward for including more uncle blocks. And so I imagine it's probably something very similar. And I, I remember looking through some of the documentation for Nervos and uh, it's not in the uh, header, but it's in another 
spot in the block and it doesn't count towards the block's uh, size limit. Uh, so that way as to avoid disincentivizing the uh, inclusion of them. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of how, it, it's very similar to an Ethereum in that way. Uh, what, what I found really interesting in, was in the, you know, reading through that uh, economic model of the, uh, it was very interesting to see that like I've never actually seen it presented in such a way that selfish mining is actually an attack on difficulty of readjustment. Because I don't know, I feel like when I learned about selfish mining, that that wasn't how it was presented. But then I read one of the papers that was actually linked into in your documentation, and that was actually very interesting to see that like you know if you actually solve the selfish how difficulty readjustment works and make it take into account uh, the orphan blocks, then yeah, yeah, it actually selfish mining becomes much less of a concern. There's not really much of an attack that you can do there. Yeah, it's very interesting because we actually saw this, uh, you know, firsthand experience during our testnet. So we have something called mining competition. Basically, we uh, encourage people to to uh, mine the testnet, and they can get some, you know, testnet tokens that can be converted to mainnet tokens later. And then uh, we actually saw somebody launch a selfish mining, like this huge organization <laughs> reward, right? And um, but then we saw that going on for some time, and then just stopped. So our hypothesis is obviously that you know the person who was doing the attack, it was test that, so that's why they could realize it's not profitable, right? So the you compare the income of just being mining honestly versus uh, you know doing selfish mining. So that was really interesting for us to see. Yeah. So just kind of an end of the story <laughs> to to what you said. So. Maybe they take a step back, actually. What made you guys decide to use uh, proof of work in the first place? Because it seems nowadays, like, you know, today, all these, all the new networks that are launching are all using proof of stake. In this month alone, I, I mean, I run a validator and I've been, I think I started, I'm like, you know, there's four new uh, proof of stake test nets that are launching in January. What, what made you guys to launch, guys decided to launch a proof of work network in 2020 or 2019? <laughs> yeah, so we're like you said, we're just about the only blockchain sort of launched amongst uh, the you know other blockchains that kind of started around the same time. Uh, you know, again, I think it, it has a lot to do with the overall vision of Nervous Network, which is you know we don't try to the layer. Well, we believe the layer one protocol needs to be rock solid and then somewhat conservative in a way, not to try to do too many things and not to try to, you know, do both, uh, you know, decentralization and, and, and scaling and then, you know, rely on uh, novel cryptography. And, uh, you know, what we want to have on the layer one is, like I said, very rock solid, decentralized and battle battle proven. And then something that has been studied in research for a very long time. And then this is, you know, at the time we look at all the research that's done with the Bitcoin uh, consensus algorithm. It's just about the only one that fits this uh, only candidate that fits this requirement you know ever since we started to look into uh, sort of more uh, properties of proof of work and then you know we feel that we we made a good choice because whether you you think about you know having this um you know global settlement layer and then the uh, the, the security properties you want for that whether you want to have a sustainable blockchain and then you know what you need for that and then whether it's about decentralization you know, even people talk about, you know, sure, proof of work, uh, there's mining pools, and then they may not be, you know, entirely centralized. Uh, but it's the same for proof of stake as well. You have staking pools or staking as a service programs, even more so like a recent like Binance and some exchanges got into the staking business and then charge zero fees. So you start to see this, you can say, you know, the staking service becoming a very much decentralized force. And then it tends to Sort of focus on the ecosystem service provider that already have a lot of power, uh, like again wallets and exchanges. And the reason is because they have they have coins, they have tokens. So it's very easy to see like th these players will consolidate power over a long time. And for proof of stake, it's very difficult to break out of that monopoly, if you will, because uh, you know for as long as you know large stakers. Uh, continue to because this is like the rich get richer sort of theory, right? So if they uh, continue to stake, they will retain their 
monopoly in the ecosystem, sort of like, you know, we have seen again for delegate proof of stake, like EOS and how some of the issues persist there. I think for uh, regular proof of stake, it's, it's not an immediate concern, but you know things could move towards similar direction with the staking providers and certain community. Uh, with the proof of work, the difference is for these monopolies like mining pools to retain their power, it has a huge operating cost. So they have to invest real resources and then keep innovating and then uh, to stay on the edge of technology to keep their monopoly. And, you know, with technology, tech, you know, the paradigm of technology shifts every decades or so, then it's a lot more difficult for them to retain that monopoly power forever. So I'm not saying proof of work, right? There's no like mining pool uh, standardization issues, but it's a lot easier uh, in our uh, opinion. So that can change over time. You know, this includes the, you know, the, the mining machine uh, producers and, you know, mining pools and even like where the lowest electricity cost is, because again, that can change uh, with technical uh, innovation over over long term. What made you decide to use like NC Max, which is you know very similar to like Bitcoin esque proof of work or Nakamoto consensus, as opposed to some of the more uh, you know maybe more newer approaches to Nakamoto uh, improvement on Nakamoto consensus, such as. Bitcoin NG or more DAG-like protocols. I feel like a DAG-like system would actually be really, you know, one of the cons of DAG system is you do need uh, a UTXO system often to make it very efficient, which happens to be what you have. Yeah, I mean, uh, so whether we use Nakamoto consensus or some variation of it, that's half the question, right? So that for that, I, I think it would be probably good to have uh, our consensus researcher, Jen, uh, to be here. And because that's exactly what he focuses on for his like entire uh, research and, you know, his PhD program and, and all that. And, um, so he is actually known as the person that broke Bitcoin Unlimited. <laughs> so he will give a very good answer to the question. So, yeah. So he basically, you know, studied all the variations and then look at the chain quality and look at, you know, other properties and decided Nakamoto consensus is actually you know, the best of, um, the, uh, of all the alternatives. So just to give a little bit of background. So this NC Max algorithm was developed, uh, while he was, uh, he worked uh, for Blockstream and under the mentorship of Greg and Peter, some of the uh, prominent Bitcoin uh, researchers. And then, uh, so there was definitely a lot of, uh, sort of Bitcoin influence into this. And there's, you know, a lot of thoughts on how to maximize the uh, sort of the protocol efficiency of the Bitcoin's consensus algorithm. And uh, so that would be a great question for him. But I, I know that's what he says, right? So I know that's his research area. There's a really great talk that he gave at the Scaling Bitcoin Meetup in San Francisco last year, about a year ago, uh, which was was incredible uh, for my uh, research for this inter- for this interview. So I'll I'll link to that in the show notes. I would recommend um, anyone who's interested in learning more about that check out that talk. There's also a series of blog posts on your website which kind of summarizes uh, the contents of that talk uh, that we'll link to uh, as well in the show notes. Yeah, I think that would be the best. I wanted to ask you about mining. Uh, so you have your own hashing algorithm. So I presume that Bitcoin ASICs won't work on Nervos. Can you talk about sort of like what the mining ecosystem looks like? Yeah. So we have our own uh, hash function, and then um, and, and you know we we thought this you know for uh, for for quite a bit, and you know really reusing any existing hash function put the project at uh, at risk, uh, especially when you start, because there is this inventory of existing machines that can always point to uh, your blockchain and then, you know, double spend or, or attack the blockchain, basically. Um, so this is the reason that we develop our own hash function called EagleSong. So in terms of uh, evolution of the mining ecosystem of Nervos uh, CKB, it will be very similar to how Bitcoin uh, you know, you started with the CPU. Uh, in fact, I talk about the mining competition that we did. The first phase of mining competition, like everybody just CPU mined uh, some coins. 
And then it will, you know, shift to GPU uh, miners and then from GPU to FPGAs. So right now, I think as we speak, we have both uh, GPU miners and FPGA miners on, uh, on those. And then eventually we'll move to a more ASIC, you know, based mining uh, ecosystem. So we are supported pretty much just by all the major mining pools. You know, we're pretty happy with the, you know, the, the, the hash rate distribution and uh, also the um, enthusiasm from the mining community. Yeah, I'm actually in the process of uh, setting up a mining rig myself for Nervos. So I have my I have my Grin miner and I'm <laughs> turning that off and just trying to install the Nervos software right now. Unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to get it to finish it in time for the episode. But so yeah, let's uh, move on to uh, the VM, uh, the CKB VM, because that's actually one of the uh, most interesting pieces that I really like because. Uh, you know, this is the VM I've always dreamed of. I, you know, I wanted to always build, I always wanted at some point to get around to designing a smart contracting system that uses UTXOs. And then I found out, oh, wow, this is, uh, you know, this is what you guys ended up creating. So could you tell tell me a little bit about the uh, cell model and what, what exactly is it? What does it mean to be like separating state generation and state verification? Why is this the design you decided to go with? Yeah, so happy to. That's the core of the you know the ledger structure, and um, so cell model is a UTXO like you know ledger structure or data structure, if you will. So if you start with Bitcoin UTXOs, and Bitcoin UTXO can only express one piece of information, which is balance or amounts, right, amount of bitcoins, and um, so you generalize that, and then you are able to support uh, you know for example any type of information you can you know, do token balances, uh, for example. And then you add the capability of sort of smart contract or a fully Turing complete scriptability that will execute the virtual machine. And that becomes the cell model. So a cell is basically a uh, generalized piece of UTXO. And when you, uh, just like a Bitcoin, when you create a transaction, you have inputs and outputs. So in Nervo CKB, when you, uh, when I say CKB, by the way, they, <laughs> I realized I didn't uh, explain it just due to the acronym. Uh, it stands for Common Knowledge Base, uh, which is the layer one blockchain for Nervos Network. Okay, so just just a little ca- uh, a side note. So the, the CKB, yeah, that's an important point. So CKB is what you call this Common Knowledge Base, which is in fact the layer one that supports everything else. Yeah, so CKB is just one layer one blockchain. And then for layer two, you can have many blockchains. And or other like uh, channels and all that. So when you create a transaction on the Nervo CKB, you also uh, create inputs and outputs, just like uh, just like you create Bitcoin transactions. And then the inputs are basically cells instead of UTXOs, right? So you have multiple cells that can be part of the inputs, and then the outputs uh, are again the that's the result. So when you create a transaction when it's when it's verified and executed, accepted the inputs then will be spent, right? So these cells go to what we call dead cells or expired cells. And then the outputs are the new cells, right? So the entire of, un, it, so for Bitcoin, it's the set of unspent transaction outputs. That's the current global state, right? For Nervos, it's the, uns, you can say it's the unspent cell outputs, right? So that would be the global state for, for Nervos. So smart contracts can be, uh, you know, the code can be also part of the cell, right? So this is where, we have two type of scripts, right? So what we call, like for Bitcoin, you have this lock script. And then for Nervos, there are two type of scripts. One is lock script, just like a Bitcoin. So you can still say, you know, I have my private key, I'm going to unlock this. For Bitcoin, I'm going to unlock the UTXO to be able to spend it for, for, for Nervos. You'll be able to unlock the cell to put in to, uh, to make the cell part of the inputs of a transaction, right? So that's what lock script is. It allows you to include a cell as one of the inputs of the transaction. And then you have uh, the second type of script, what we call type script for a cell. So every cell has two scripts, right? So lock and type. So the type script, not to confuse with the programming language, but type script is, it allows you to put um, the cells as the outputs of the transaction. In other words, you can, you know, the type scripts 
verifies that the state transition from input to output actually is valid according to a pre-specified rules. Uh, again, that's based, we're talking about smart contracts, right? That's how I would say, you know, the, the cell model is a generalized UTXO model. So it takes basically input output, you know, style and transaction structure and then, but just add this TypeScript to make sure that you can run the verification rules in the virtual machine, uh, effectively smart contract to, you know, impose rules on state transitions. Would it be fair to kind of classify, um, this is taking almost a bit of a more like functional programming exactly. approach. You got it. Right. Where like instead of this data that has these functions, like Ethereum smart contracts where I'm calling functions that are mutating the state of this contract. Instead, what I'm doing is sort of defining contracts as these like pure functions, which are these lock scripts and type scripts. And I'm basically burning the old state of a contract and by passing it through this function, and it outputs a new state of a contract, which is this new cell. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. It's a very you know predicate based, right? So the uh, verification engine or the virtual machine execution, the result, it's just a boolean. It's true or false, right? So it's just a valid or invalid transaction. If it's valid, then it's accepted by the blockchain. If it's invalid, it'll be rejected. And like you said, right? So it's you actually spend or burn the old state, and then you have this new state coming out of the outputs. And are there rules of what kind of outputs have to be generated from the burning of this input? How would I string a series of functions, lock scripts together in order to make one larger you know, workflow uh, at, that like, you'd, a user would want to do? Yeah, you got it, right? So that's what you're describing is equivalent of smart in Ethereum, smart contracts calling the other smart contract. And then what you're describing is the equivalent paradigm in, in, in Nervo. So it's a very, you know, instead of object composability, right? So, you know, uh, you know Ether or Commodore or Ethereum, it's kind of this like old programming paradigm where you have, you know, accounts that have internal states. And then when you interact with them, you mutate the state and then objects themselves can pass messages and they can you know use that to to mutate other objects and then in Nervo CKB that's what you just said is the same how you compose transactions together uh, or you know equivalent smart contracts together is that you pass them through a series of transactions so that how outputs can limit it to inputs and so on and so forth you construct transactions the series of transactions that way and all the computation for this is done off chain, correct? So the, the blockchain only stores the state, but uh, the computation is done on, I guess, individual nodes? The verification happens on the blockchain. Again, let's think about Bitcoin. I think it's easier to, to use Bitcoin to explain uh, some of the concepts. Again, we're very similar to the UTXO model. So with the Bitcoin, you construct the transactions, you know, the code that to construct the transaction happens off chain. So this is in your wallet. You search for UTXOs, right? It's like, okay, I've got this many UTXOs, which I'm going to include uh, you know, as part of the transaction. So that's not Bitcoin core code, right? That's just the wallet will search, do the transaction, uh, UTXO searching. But um, verification, which means things like either input and off, output have to be balanced, that happens on chain. So verification always happens on chain. For us, it's the same. So constructing of transactions is off chain. And then, but the verification, uh, you know, whether you can, you know, verify signatures and whether the TypeScript, uh, you know, running the virtual machine can return true, Boolean true value that happens on, on chain. So it makes sure that the, these rules are, are verified. So if I understand that correctly, so, you know, maybe another way to think of it as well is not just as a functional th system, but it's also a declarative uh, smart contracting system. And so maybe to give an example of like this idea of why state verification is should be done on chain, but generation could be done off chain is imagine you had a smart contract and the point of this was to sort a, uh, a list of numbers, right? From smallest to biggest, the sorting algorithm would take n log n time, but the verification that a list is sorted 
actually only takes linear time. And so you could basically require that whoever is generating the smart contract, they do the sorting on their wallet. But when they put it on the chain, everyone is just verifying that the list is sorted, not actually doing the sorting algorithm themselves. And that actually allows you to basically make, you know, the work that everyone else has to do much smaller. Yeah. So yeah, I think you got exactly right. Right. So you specify specifically what you care about to verify, you know, not the procedure, uh, you know, the steps to get there. And then everybody just by taking the same steps and see, oh, are we arriving at the same state? Right. But instead you say, I'm just going to, this is what I care about. And in the end, it has to verify to this. Right. And then, uh, yeah, like you said, right. The computation and verification can have a symmetry in terms of the complexity. And uh, this actually, you know, the sorting algorithm you mentioned, it's very sort of reminiscent to you know, a lot of the zero knowledge proof stuff that we see today, right? So how do you sort of reduce generalized computation or, or special computation into some sort of, you know, set circuit and, and, and rules that can be more easily verified, at least, you know, reduce complexity to, to perform so. Right. I was just going to mention this. This seems like sort of like, you know, ZK roll up in a way as well, where it's like, you know, the computation of the, the generation of the proof is all done client side, but the verification, which is simple, is the actual lock algorithm. And so I guess, so is this kind of what you guys are implying when you're saying that it's well designed for L2 systems in the way that it kind of can make it easy to do these roll up style processes? I think it is. I mean, back then when we first, you know, started with this direction, zero knowledge, like roll up, roll up was not even the term. Right? Um, so there was definitely early layer two solution that was built. But, you know, when we look at it, it's really, it kind of points to that direction is, you know, I don't care all the, every single state transitions that happen on layer two or either off chain, as long as we can come to a agreement uh, on layer one and, you know, either crypto economically or by some other means that we can say, okay, this is what we all agree. And then that's really it. I want to verify that's the final state we want to verify. And then, so this sort of paradigm match, maps very well to that, uh, to the way of thinking. So what happens now when you actually want to create a smart contract or where you want multiple people to be able to interact with it? in the course of a single block, right? So let's say you have an ICO or something that's happening and, you know, there's no reason that multiple people can't participate in the ICO in a single block. But the problem is there's only one cell and whoever hits it first ends up killing that cell. And the second transaction that tries to buy from that ICO, that cell is no longer there. So how do you construct paradigms like that in this UTXO cell model? Yeah, so it's a, I think what you're pointing to is kind of like a parallel processing, right? That could be allowed by the UTXO model. And in Nervos, when you construct transactions, you actually specify the dependencies of the transactions. And it's explicitly, right? So the, then the runtime can sort of do this dependency mapping and see, okay, these transactions can actually be executed in a parallel uh, fashion or verified in a parallel way. So that they could, as long as they're not conflicting with each other, they don't grab the same cells and you know things like that, then they can be processed uh, in parallel. But what if they are trying to hit the same cell? So imagine this cell was a like counter on a tweet, right? So I tweeted something on this Twitter thing built on CKB, and this cell is how many likes it has. Let's say two people try to like it, and, and the current value is five, right? And the... Pure, the smart contract, the lock function is that it will increment by one, right? So two people both try to send a like, and they send the declarative value of six. The first person will increase the, the like counter from five to six. The second person's like will fail because it will say, oh, it's already at six. How would I have it so both people's likes can you know happen in the same block? I don't want it so that Every time you do a like, it's like, oh, your like got sent in the same block as someone else. You have to go redo the like again. You know, for for those instances, um, you may have to, well, one of them will be accepted. So whichever comes first and then will, you know, that transaction will be propagated the fastest and, you know, have global consensus. And again, it's chain-based consensus algorithm like NCMAX. So it's possible, you know, strictly speaking, these 
two uh, votes will be in different blocks on different chains temporarily, but eventually the network will get to consensus. And uh, if we're talking about like transactions, you know, in the same block, and yes, so one of them will be rejected. You know, the previous one was included in there, then the next one will be rejected. Isn't this pretty bad UX then? This is, again, you, you could, I mean, this is where you could, we have a term actually internally called layer 1.5, right? So this is where you can have aggregators sort of aggregate all the transactions and then uh, to, you know, propagate and produce blocks. And then, you know, that's kind of similar to the issues you, you talk about. Uh, but, so I, I think when we talk about here, there is, we do have a concept uh, again, this is different from Ethereum account model and smart contracts where you have effectively everybody's balance within one single account and then everybody try to kind of mutate the same object, if you will. Um, with the Nervos, it's different in that all the, let's say, again, say ICOs, right? So all the ICO participants actually operating on their own cell, right? So if I have a balance of a token, let's say 100 tokens, it's actually uh, contained in my own cell. Right. And then you token balance, you also own the cell that contain your balance. So I can unlock my cell and then, you know, spend my token and maybe send to Sebastian and you can do the same as well. And this is important. Again, this is just like a Bitcoin ETH. So let's think about it. Right. So everybody's own asset is, we call this a bearable asset. Right. So everybody like truly owns the asset um, that you, that you, that you have. So this way, when I try to mutate my cell, let's say I send Sebastian, you know, a few tokens, then that's going to be independent of you trying to mutate. You maybe want to send somebody else some tokens. We don't have to like lock the contract so that I can update and then you update, for example. In Nervos, it's called first class assets. Just means, you know, the ownership of assets or tokens are segregated uh, by users, uh, if you will. So taking a step back and looking at this and comparing it to Bitcoin, just so that we get an idea of where it sits sort of next to Bitcoin and, and how it compares to it. The only things that separate it from Bitcoin are the cell model, which is a generalized version of UTXO where we also have state in addition to public key balances. The other thing is this uh, consensus mechanism that improves the throughput by detecting the uncle rate and adjusting difficulty based on the current uncle rate. Are those the only two things that separate this from Bitcoin? Yeah, another big difference is uh, the Brix 5 virtual machine. So Bitcoin does not have a virtual machine, right? So it's a fixed amount of upcode, and then you can use that to construct like a multi-sig, like simple smart contract, if you will. But with uh, Nervos, it's full Turing complete scriptability. So it means, you know, you can have like our logs and our TypeScript can run the virtual machine. So this is, I think Sunny kind of mentioned a little bit uh, when we before we got to cell model. So RIX-5 is a standard for, like a CPU standard, CPU architecture. The virtual machine of uh, Nervo CKB, it's essentially like a RIX-5 computer simulator, which means all the programming language that can compile down to like the LLVM or GCC tool chain can be then used um, to script uh, on Nervo CKB. You can use these languages to write uh, your equivalent of smart contracts on Nervos. So that is, I would also say, a big improvement over Bitcoin. And also the crypto economic model we haven't got to yet, but we can get to that later. I guess that's an important distinction as well. I mean, from what I was asking was more a sort of protocol and consensus aspect of it. Yeah, let's talk about Risk Five a little bit. So Risk Five is a framework, like a very low-level framework where that gets implemented in things like CPUs. And then that's where then very low level languages get built and can interact with like core processing of computer. I mean, that's kind of a simplified version of what Risk v uh, description of what Risk v is. But why did you want to build such a low level uh, VM and not keep it at a, a sort of higher level of exception? I think there are several reasons. So one of the most important reasons is if you look at hardware specifications, it's very rare that they change. Or if they change, it's very rigorous process. And then they almost always observe backward compatibility. So not to, because again, producing hardware is very, very expensive. They want to preserve the, the prior investments. This is perfect for blockchain space because blockchains have almost have a hardware-like property, which means 
like new opcode is very difficult. It needs a lot of justification to add. It's very difficult to break the current operating system, if you will. And then you don't want to upgrade too often. And then when you want to update often, you want to be able to make sure that existing smart contracts and whatnot can still be preserved. From that point of view, I think it's it's really good. It's an open protocol, and then it has a lot of ecosystem players. Uh, it's been rising in popularity in the last couple of years. It's essentially the sort of the anti-Intel alliance, right? So a lot of big ecosystems, a lot of industry players pour a lot of money into this. Even it evolves at new instructions, for example, it always well compartmentalized. It doesn't break the, the previous one, which is very different from other separate standards like um, you know, WebAssembly. Because you know, WebAssembly is sort of this standard created by this alliance of competitors, of uh, browser vendors, and they have very specific concerns. And then you know, they have sort of conflict of interest, and then they use, you know, for example, it's a more high-level virtual machine. And then we can get to a little bit like why lower level is easier. Also, it's not designed to work for like a blockchain or this kind of space. For example, for RIX-5 virtual machine, because it's a CPU simulator, we can actually use the CPU cycles to precisely measure computation unit, like the equivalent of the gas in Ethereum, right? So how much of this computation costs? The CPU computation cycle will tell exactly how many cycles that this computation will cost. Whereas in, in Watson, it's a lot more difficult because it's a higher level virtual machine and even has garbage collection. So when that kind of got thrown into the whole equation, it's just really difficult to do that. Being such a low level programming language, what's the developer experience like? As a developer entering the nervous ecosystem, I want to build a DAP or a DAO or something. What do I need to learn in addition to knowing how to code? say, like Go, for instance? Basically, whatever languages that can be compiled down to run on a RIX-5 computer, you're able to run on a virtual machine. Again, it's just a computer simulator, right? So again, as I was saying, that this industry standard is evolving very, very fast. And then there are like industry players putting a lot of money into this. For example, like the C ecosystem, uh, you can definitely, you wouldn't recommend people like build a smart contract with C, but Theoretically speaking, that's the easiest way to start with the C programming and even higher languages, if you sort of they can compile down to C, then they can be supported as well. One of the, I would say, like a really good property of this is that a lot of the crypto primitives are actually very well supported, like in the C ecosystem. A lot of them are written in C or can be easily compiled down to C. And um, so if you want to use a crypto primitive, let's say, you know, for your zero knowledge proof solutions, you'd have to wait for Ethereum to hard fork. And then add that, you know, pre-compile or things like that. You can just roll your sleeves and then drop that in and then into the Rig5 computer and then add your own library. And then you can just use it very, very easily. We have some community members that are working on this and it's been pretty good and, you know, supporting some uh, signature algorithms that, you know, natively supported by, you know, mobile phone chips and, you know, even browser. So like the private key solution will be much more smooth on, on Nervous than, or much faster to get there than other solutions and other platforms. Is there a like tutorials that people can follow for like writing smart contracts on this? Because like, you know, compiling Rust down to WebAssembly or to Risk 5 is one thing, but you also need to make sure your contracts follow the lock and TypeScript like rules and how those are formatted and whatnot. To your answer, there is. I think at this by this stage, uh, the best way is probably to pop into our Telegram uh, Neuros Network slash Dev channel and to get help there. So we do have uh, you know documentation, and there are developers that have built tutorials and you know show how to do things. But it's definitely not as mature as some of the other uh, ecosystems. So I would recommend that developers want to roll their sleeves, just come to talk to us. We're all hanging out there, so we're very friendly and helpful. Let's just move on uh, to the last thing that we met, we talked about, which was, you know, the big differentiator here is the economic model of uh, CKB. Can you tell us about what CK bytes are and why that economic model was chosen in order to design a multi-asset store assets chain? Again, so this is kind of our tagline for layer one protocol. And 
So I, to answer your first question, the native token of the nervous CKB is called CK bytes, right? So one CK byte or one coin, if you will, represents one byte, a claim to one byte of global state. So in a way, if you own, you know, let's say 10,000 CK bytes, you own 10,000 of the global state, right? 10,000 bytes of the overall global state in the blockchain. The reason we do this, so I'll start with the problem, then we can talk about like why we arrive at the solution. And one of the differentiator I feel that to really become a good layer one is if transactions are moving to layer two, and that's where you know it's cheaper and faster and everything to do transactions, then what's the purpose of layer one, right? So in our view, layer one is should be for asset preservation or provide security and sort of this censorship resistance or just decent property for the assets. So layer one should be where assets are. And then different from Bitcoin, Bitcoin, there's only one asset, which is the BTC itself on the Bitcoin blockchain. On any smart contract platform, you have many infinite user-defined assets. The goal of the layer one protocol is to make sure it provides the sustainability so that the assets are going to be long-term secure, right? So this is what we call the concept we call store of assets or multi-asset store of value, right? If you compare Bitcoin to single asset store of value. What are the properties that when you design this sort of multi-asset store of value system? So think about this, right? So think about when you have multiple assets, let's say on Ethereum. Miners in Ethereum, miners are paid with fixed amount of ETH per block. So in Bitcoin, miners are paid with fixed amount of BTC per block. And this makes sense. Uh, and this will make their economic work because if the asset value increases a thousand times, right? If Bitcoin's value appreciates a thousand times, the miner's income will also appreciate a thousand times because they get fixed amount of BTC per block. So this makes Bitcoin a good uh, store of value because you know, it's like when you have a city, right? So when your assets are appreciating, then the defense automatically de appreciating as well. The protocol can provision defense, you know, as the asset value rises and, and, and to go down. So on Ethereum, that's not the case because if the assets on Ethereum goes up and down, right, they have almost no correlation with the ETH value. So in other words, if you think about this, hypothetically, the ideal native token for Ethereum blockchain, right? If you take the store of assets, or, you know, mindset, the ideal native token should be some sort of an index fund unit of all its assets weighed by, you know, market cap. Then a single unit of that index fund can be used to pay miners because then if this whole ecosystem goes up and down, you know, the, the whole asset value goes up, then this native value also goes up and provide more protection for the security of the protocol. But for Ethereum, it uses entirely different ETH asset to add minor compensation. So as your all the crypto assets on the Ethereum goes up like 10 times or 100 times, you can't guarantee that the defense will go up uh, with them. And this provides in our mind, this is the issue for cryptonomics because attackers can always just attack your sort of your base consensus protocol to be able to double send these assets if there's enough incentive. If maker token really appreciate that many times, then they can attack the Ethereum consensus algorithm. Another flip side of this is really the, the, the different side of the same coin. The flip side of this is you can think of on Ethereum, it's really the ETH holder, ETH holder that provide security by volunteering diluting the ETH supply to provide that security to the miners. But these crypto asset holders are not making similar contribution, right? So uh, these tokens might not inflate and then pay the miners for their, because their, their assets are also protected, but they're not contributing to this common good. And then whenever you have this tragic of common issues, when the incentives are not aligned and you're not making people to contribute to the common good, then it can be abused and there will be issues. And you got you know, people that free ride the security and then in our mind, it's not sustainable. So how do you turn CK Bytes into that index fund? It's very difficult to truly build an index fund, right, on the blockchain. So the example I gave 
is to point to a direction that you know where we need to think about this issue, and then that the solution in our mind resides in the fact that you need to have a native token that can capture the demand of all the crypto assets running on the blockchain, right? So in other words, if I'm a maker holder, token holder, and I need to hold a maker token, I need to contribute to the blockchain overall security as well. So it needs to be this single asset that can capture the demand of all the assets on the blockchain. The other one is that this sort of contribution it has to scale over time. In other words, if I hold my token for longer, then I need to contribute more to the security of the network, right? So it has to scale with both space and time. So our native token is called CK Bytes, which represent the claim to the global state. So the idea is any crypto asset demand will result in occupation of global state. If Maker, for example, grows and uh, you know their market cap and more users, and then they will also occupy more of the global state, which put demand on the native token. So the native token is basically this value capture of the entire ecosystem, if you will. So this is, we typically like here, we make the analogy of land, right? So you can open different shops, you can open, you know, McDonald's and laundry, laundromat and all the different shops. They are very different in their own way and they have their own ecosystems and, you know, economic uh, properties, but they all occupy land. So whatever shop you open, it will put demand on land. So land is then this value capture of this ecosystem. So this single property or single asset that can capture the value of the multiple assets or economic being built on the blockchain. So that's, I think, our insight. It seems to capture the number of users that are holding a token, but not exactly the value of the tokens, right? Because let's say there's 1 million users holding MKR, if the value of MKR 10x is suddenly, that doesn't actually increase the amount of storage that MKR is using. Only if it's the number of MKR holders 10x's does it increase the demand for storage. If you add another pre-assumption, which is the global state is scarce, it has to be, a, if it's an infinite resource, then you're right. But if it's a scarce resource, which means it's actually market priced, Right, so which means that the more demand you put on land, it actually drive up the land price. So which means, if you think about like corporation balance sheet, right? If the cost of preserving value or you know build a building in this city is this much, if it's very high, then I will not build the building here because the relative cost is too high. If maker value increases, that will decrease the relative cost of every single holder's relative cost of putting on the blockchain. So if it costs me 10 cents to store a thousand dollars of value, for me, that's a no brainer. So if it costs a hundred dollars to store a thousand dollars, then it's different calculation. So the way we see this is it will be sort of a process because the global state is a scarce resource, it will become a process of value density on the blockchain keep increasing. And as you keep increasing those lower value sort of application or occupation will be slowly move out of the blockchain and move to layer two, and then probably use some sort of proof and really simple ones can still utilize the security guarantees, but maybe make some sacrifices somewhere else. And then the high value assets are still going to be kept on layer one, because again, this is the most secure global consensus and everything. As value goes up, as value density goes up, so it encourages people to stay. And they encourage people to occupy and not to leave because the relative cost is is lower. Wouldn't we also just start to see people move towards more off-chain state? So instead of actually holding a lot of data on in a cell, they just store uh, hashes in the cell, like root state hashes in the cell, and then pass in the data when they make the transactions. So it'll kind of be like stateless verification on Ethereum. And that way... Any user would really only ever have constant demand for state because they could take all their personal state and put it into one 32-byte hash. I think it's all trade-offs, right? So again, we try to make the analogy of, let's say, Manhattan's land, right? So in the early days, because the land is so cheap, and then you can just build fast food restaurants in there and then not feeling like this is wasteful because it almost costs you nothing to acquire the land and build the shop. 
you won't just drop a skyscraper in Manhattan on day one because it's not that it's impossible. I mean, you you make sacrifices, which means you have to ride the elevator up and down every day, right? So for like what you described, it's putting state root and you know sort of proof on layer one does have its consequences as well because you probably have some latency trade off you have to make, and then you know if you're running on the platform, maybe there's token economics. Assumptions or liveness assumptions of you know watchtowers you have to make those assumptions so those are not without its cost uh, or trade offs so what we foresee is when the cost of global state is low then people will come and directly build on layer one sort of you know build your sort of Manhattan in the early days and then as more valuable applications come up. And then the ecosystem grows, the land price will increase, and then will automatically provision higher security and then protect more protection. And again, what we believe is this is actually has a positive feedback loop, which is just about very, very few positive feedbacks. Uh, I actually gave a talk on flywheel economics in, I think, last year's crypto economic conference on the specific topic. Uh, we can get to that or... This is part of feedback loop will is very important because the most important requirement or demand of assets on blockchain is its security, right? It's not its storage cost, right? This is some people feel like, oh, you know, storage is getting cheaper and cheaper, but why is this getting more expensive? The answer is you're not just saving something there, right? You're saving something of huge, very, very important value. So what you're paying for is really the protection of the security. As a store of asset blockchain becomes more valuable, uh, you know, have more protection, it will attract more valuable assets to migrate to the blockchain. And as you migrate to the blockchain, then this is the positive feedback loop. It will increase the token because you put more demand on the token and then increase the property and then you attract more valuable assets. That is the flywheel that we talk about. And I feel you almost have to have this sort of token economics to be able to be sustainable and to preserve more and more assets. The other chain that I think does a very similar economic model is EOS, right? Because they also have this sort of similar notion of holding EOS tokens grant you access to more of the computational resources and storage resources, so the RAM and CPU and net that they have. Their model gets much more complex because of, you know, I think they added too much complexity there. One thing that does make sense is for them, each token represents a percentage share of the capacity rather than an absolute amount. Given that CK Bytes is a, you know, fixed supply system, that means that there is a fixed amount of storage that is ever possible on this system. And doesn't that like, you know, as we see advancements in storage and storage becomes cheaper over time, wouldn't we want to basically maybe have total storage size be a governance parameter and your CK bytes is a percentage of that. And as storage gets better over time, over the years, then we can increase the total network size. Very good question. So I think I'll dissect this and detangle this in a few ways. The cost is not just about that hard drive space. The, really, the cost for the entire network is that we limit the global state. We cap the global state with the monetary policy, right? So you can every year, the maximum sort of global state is predictable. That's governed by the monetary policy, how many CK bytes you issue over time. We do this to make this a scarce resource. The reason is that we want to do this non, no compromise desalination approach. In other words, this the goal of doing this is to preserve decentralization, right? So that everybody can run a phone node, just like the BTC philosophy. Everybody can run a phone node. It's very cheap. It's very fast to sync. Developers don't have to, always have to depend on Infura for developer applications. And then there's not this very, very expensive you know, phone node that will take days to synchronize and, and all that, right? Everybody can verify independently transactions. And that's what we believe is necessary for a true decentralized global network. If you do that, then you have to cap the global state. It's not that your hard drive is not large enough, right? It can increase many, many folds uh, in the future, but the way we cap it is because we want to preserve the statistician properties and also like how fast the network can sync and, and things like that. So with this, decentralization itself, it's really public good. It's really a piece of public good. 
So which means everybody has to uh, contribute to it. If you think about our issuance policy, which is part of the crypto economics, if you think about this issuance policy, we have a Bitcoin-like sort of fixed supply, as you said. Uh, we call this first issuance or uh, base issuance, right? So this is a Bitcoin-like fixed supply issuance. That is not enough because I talked about this earlier that people that preserve assets on the blockchain have to pay with the time that they preserve their assets on the blockchain. So this is in the Ethereum called state rent, right? So the, the whole concept of state rent, how do you pay for these and, and things like that? Because our native currency is a byte of the global state, we come up with the mechanism that you can pay rent automatically with issuance. So this is what we call secondary issuance. So the idea here is this. Imagine on Bitcoin, you only want to charge a certain type of Bitcoin holders, how do you do that, right? Let's say the people who use the UTXO to store, like it's color coin to store some other data than balance. How do you charge only them for fees for state rent? So the way that we do it is, okay, so instead of, let's say Bitcoin's issuance is 50, 25, like it goes down every four years, and then we tag something along with that schedule, effectively it will be like 51, 26, 13.5 and so on and so forth. This constant component of the issuance we call secondary issuance, right, for each block. And then imagine you can give everybody this one block first. And then you take away the ones that are not using their global, their CK bytes to store data, to store state. Then you sort of compensate them for the issuance. And then for the people that do use CK bytes to store state, there, this additional issuance will go to the miners. So if 30% of the CK Bytes owners use their coin to store state, and then 65% of the uh, people, they just uh, don't use their CK Bytes to store state, right? Then 30% of the second issuance will go to the miners. Eventually, if we give everybody the same coin, that will be, you know, same issuance, that will be fair to everybody. But then you sort of divert this part to the miners. So the longer you use your, your CK byte to store data, you will keep paying miners a percentage of the issuance that would have been given to you. And then we have a special smart contract called the Nervous DAO. And if you save your coin, your native token to the Nervous DAO smart contract, you will automatically receive exactly the same sort of yield or percentage of income or percentage of the second issuance so that for you as if the second issuance does not exist and you are holding a bitcoin like fixed supply native token so what kind of projects are being built on nervos what is the sort of initial types of applications that you're seeing here we launched mainnet like two months ago and then we're already seeing the type of applications i think is best for nervos is asset-based or asset-focused sort of applications. And then, you know, broadly, you can put them into DeFi sort of camp. What we want to be is this, you know, if you think about Nervous Network itself, it's also this multi-blockchain topology similar to Cosmos and Polkadot and whatnot, right? The difference is we want to have this one single blockchain that concentrates value. And then all the other blockchains are specialized for scaling. So in a way, like in the finance world, you can think about this as like your custody provider, but decentralized, obviously. And then all the other ones are like transaction-based systems. So that's the overall sort of mind model for Nervos Network. Where can people learn more about Nervos and potentially, you know, if they're interested in, in building a blockchain, uh, how can they get started? Go to our website, nervos.org. And I think the best way to get a quick understanding of the project is read our positioning paper. And if you just go to the website, you see the petitioning paper there. It goes through a lot of what we talked through today. Thanks, Kevin, for your time today. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Sebastian and Sunny. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, 
you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.